In the time that we have left, let's consider two important questions. We've just said that Shanti Deva argues that people are not justified in having special concern for themselves over other people. And that means that we should either try to eliminate all suffering or not do anything about suffering at all. And it seems pretty clear that Shanti Deva thinks what we should do is try to eliminate all suffering. But then we need to know how to eliminate all suffering. And in order to do that, we might want to know how to act morally, as it seems these two things are closely connected in Shantideva's text. However, it seems like knowing how to act morally might also require us to know what makes an action good. Does Shantideva have an account of what makes an action good? In contemporary philosophical terms, then, we're wondering, does he have a theory of ethics? So that's our first question. And even if we answer this question, another one still remains. Is there any place for social transformation in, in Mahayana Buddhism? I mean, reading this text, you, you might think, well, he's really focused on just individuals. How in the world um, can we have anything like social transformation? And, and I guess even a second question, would a Buddhist like Shantideva even be concerned with, say, um, changing systems of oppression in the world? Or is he just concerned with individual people coming to be more compassionate and then becoming uh, Buddhas? In talking about the forbearance chapter, we worried about being too patient in the face of terrible institutional evils. Turning the other cheek is well and good when people insult us, but what should we do when governments oppress people, when structures result in inequality and suffering? In those instances, should we practice forbearance? And if so, what does that mean? The second question then is about whether Shanti Deva has something to say about social justice. Let's start with the ethical question. Really central to, um, until very recently, a lot of uh, relatively recent Western philosophy has been this question of what at the deepest conceptual level makes an action right or wrong? Is it maximizing good consequences for everyone? Um, is it acting as a virtuous person would act? Is it following some kind of obligation, some kind of rational imperative? And it's not that I think Shanti Deva doesn't have anything to say about that, but I think like Aristotle, and I tend to think like the Confucian philosophers, his central questions are ones about character broadly conceived in a way that character can be represented as reoccurring mental states. People worry about character because they think no self, you can't have, you, you sort of can't have habitual dispositions. But, you know, for Buddhists, these are kind of patterns of repeating mental states. And then I think his questions about action sort of tend to flow out from, from that. Since he's not a contemporary philosopher working with these questions, Shantideva doesn't come right out and say, I don't have a theory of what makes actions good, or my theory of what makes actions good is this. That what instead he's saying is, well, when you're in a, in a sort of a decision point, you should consider cultivating a certain kind of character, a certain set of mental states. And when you're talking about suffering, where any reasonable ethical theory is going to give concern to ending human suffering. Um, a lot of times you don't necessarily have to go all the way down to where you'd almost have to think of this strange thought experiment to see where those decisions come apart. I tend to think Shantideva tends not to put himself in those theoretical spaces and instead tends to use his philosophical insights to develop characterizations of virtuous mental states. Um, and one consequence of these will be ending suffering, but the primary issue isn't determining what exactly well-being is and a way to maximize it impartially for all beings. Someone who's a consequentialist, someone who's a deontologist, or for instance, follows a, a, a moral principle or set of principles, um, even a virtue ethicist, someone who's focusing on cultivating um, character dispositions, all of them are going to involve thinking about consequences in, in some way often. And so, but that doesn't mean that they're all going to agree on what makes an action right or wrong. It's just that when you're making a decision, you might look at the, at the consequences as part of the decision. So talk about consequences in the text shouldn't then be interpreted as this is the, um, the basic, most um, fundamental thing for him in determining whether an action is right or wrong. And as well, his text isn't concerned with theorizing alone. 
Even the argument we were introduced to in chapter 8 comes in the context of a meditation. It's an argument you're supposed to think about deeply, repeatedly, over time. You don't just write it up in premise conclusion form, check for its validity and soundness, and then happily move on. You meditate on it. So his project may just not be concerned with ethics in the very particular sense that some philosophers today are concerned. But what Shantideva's relationship is to ethical theory is in fact a difficult question, and it's one that I will challenge you to think about, especially as Dr. Harris just has, in comparison to the other philosophers we've been reading. Maybe you disagree, and you think Shantideva is, for instance, concerned with the consequences of our actions, and he's concerned with them so much that we should infer that he thinks consequences are what make actions right or wrong. That's possible, and that's just one of the interpretations and approaches to Shanti Davis text that I'll encourage you to think about as you're reading. The other question that we were asking is whether Shanti Deva has something to say about social justice. You know, when we look at the examples he gives, he's giving a lot of very simple examples of interpersonal harm, and he's not really talking about systemic problems. You know, he's not he's not addressing issues with the government or issues related to, um, you know, uh, casteism or or racism or other other issues like that. You know, or poverty. I don't know if Shanti Deva was really thinking about things on that kind of broader level. Um, but I think that one of the things that's really amazing about this text is that we can take what he's saying and apply it to broader systemic problems. It doesn't have to just be on this interpersonal level. So when Shanti Deva talks about um, you know being being hit with a stick, and how you shouldn't get angry at the person because the person is controlled by their hatred, um, I think we could apply that to pretty much any other kind of injustice on a broader level. According to Dr. Kasser, given the aims of the text, it seems like Shantideva himself wasn't thinking about the systemic issue of injustice in pre-modern India. At least there's no explicit textual evidence for it. But we, as modern readers, might be able to draw out implications for these ideas, if we agree to them, and we could apply them to systemic causes of suffering. After all, on a Buddhist point of view, even if systems are conventional, they can still be causes of suffering. I mean, we don't need to have an essential self called Nagasena or Shanti Deva in order for that self to be subject to cause and effect. Likewise, we can give an analysis of how conventional groupings of people that we call Singapore or India or Yale and US are involved in the causes and conditions that give rise to suffering. So what Shanti Deva is saying is, you know, okay, well, you get angry at the person who hit you with the stick, or you call for this one particular police officer to be fired. That might make you feel better in the short term, but it's not actually going to stop that action from happening again in the future. And in order to do that, you really have to recognize the causes and conditions that allowed for that harm to happen in the first place. So I think even though Shanti Deva wasn't writing about those things specifically, I think we can take what he's saying and apply that to a much broader kind of situation. Of course, we want to draw these implications carefully. We need to understand what Shantideva is saying before we can make applications to the modern day. And, and I think one of the things that um, is really helpful as you're reading through this text is to really pause and reflect on the examples, because some of the examples, don't, don't, they're not applicable to us today in the 21st century. Um, but if you can understand the point that's being made through the examples and and really pause, you know, it'll, it'll take you longer to read through the text. But but if you pause at these examples and think, well, what's an example of, of this kind of situation in my own life and how would I react in that situation? Um, I think that's that's where, where you really find some, some benefit in the text, and that's where the text becomes really meaningful. But this is one of the reasons the text has remained popular for so long. Generations of philosophers, generations of Buddhist practitioners, and generations of ordinary readers have found connections with its ideas and found its arguments and images challenging. I hope that you'll find the same this week. Thanks for your time, and thanks to my guests for their willingness to join in virtually.
Yeah, you're welcome. Glad to do it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for chatting with me. I hope you guys have fun reading through it. I think it's a great text.